It's always an honor to come and bring the word. I know that Pastor Tracy guards, we used to call this the pulpit. We don't call it the pulpit anymore. Uh, The stand. She guards the stand. But she's very particular who stands here to deliver the word, and I'm honored always to be able to come and share this with you. Uh, Delighted to be part of our Freedom Church family. Online, bless you. It's so great that we can reach out even beyond these walls and touch lives for the glory of God. Well, I enjoyed, if you were here last week, the beginning of this series, Pastor Tracy is calling Green Lights, Green Lights. And as she began, she was talking about her experience with green lights in the city of Hamilton. And Arlene and I know the city of Hamilton very well. She was born and raised there, and I moved there uh, in my late teen years, and we met, and, and uh, we got into stuff, and now here we are together. We are delighted. But you know, I was thinking about that. And her talking about driving down Main Street, which is downtown Hamilton, one way, and King Street goes the other way. One goes east, one goes west, and they go for a long way, and I know that. And it was 50 years ago this month that I met my beautiful wife. She ran after me, and she caught me. (laughs) You ask her that, and she says, that's true. And we've had a wonderful time. Two and a half years later, we were married. And, uh, man, that's a long time ago. Fifty years ago. And I remember taking some drives down Main Street. We could, you could do that, particularly in the evening. And it was pretty empty. There wasn't a lot of traffic. And I had my 1966 Beaumont convertible with a 283 that just sailed And we would go down and head the music up on the radio. Yeah, that's, that's, I don't know, kids, that's, that's a thing that comes in. You can actually hear things from other places and it happens. Radios. We had the radio cranked and good speakers and we would sail down there. And you could literally go from one end of King Street for kilometers and hit every light green. You literally could. 50 years ago. And you would do that. Here's the problem. I was then, by then, a young adult, and I wasn't always patient because you had to drive with the synchronization of the lights. And I found myself many times hitting a red and starting to mutter, and then I realized it was my fault. I was going too fast. I got to slow down. I got to slow down and drive the speed limit I got to go that, you know, what, what's required. Well, that was hard. Did anybody find that hard? Back in my days, I, I was a speeder. Now I'm a senior, and I, I go under the speed limit. <laughs> Not really, but, you know, you're thinking that. You're thinking that. These old people, they learn to drive. And we would go, and it struck me, Pastor Tracy. There's almost a, an analogy there, isn't there? You're already there? Okay. Since we know the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And you know what I found in my life? There are times when I get ahead of the Holy Spirit. You know what? It's never good. Never good. And there are times I get behind the Holy Spirit. I'm not staying up with Him and I lose out. But when I learn how the Holy Spirit speaks and how He leads, I'm right in that sweet spot. And I hit every light green. When I hit a red light... Stop, recalibrate, Holy Spirit, help me to get, I want to, I want to go where you want me to go. Isn't that pretty good, eh? Huh? Not bad? I used to, people used to say, well, you know what, if you, if you hear nothing else today, remember that. I don't want that to happen. I want you to listen to what I'm saying now. I was a great story, but I want you to listen to what I'm saying. This is the second message in Green Lights. First one is a call to salvation, which is God's call to every single human being. Without exception, he has called us. It's a green light. You can't, there's nobody can say, well, I'm not good enough to be be saved. I'm not good enough for this. 
Yes, you are. Salvation is a call for everybody. Today, we're going to talk about the call to worship. Did you know you have a green light to be a worshiper? I, you know, if I asked every person in this room today, what is worship? I would get a different definition from every single person. You would describe, well, worship is this, worship is that. You would tell me. And I know that. You know how to put into words what you really mean by worship. I remember when I was young and growing up in the 1950s and 1960s. And, you know, I, I, I had this idea that worship uh, was going to church. And worship was something that was really awesome. It was something that uh, yeah, I didn't really understand, but I knew that there was something supernatural going on. And, and I knew that it was connected with praise because people would say, well, we need to praise and worship. I, that was my assumption that, you know, when I'd come together, we gather together. And in fact, church was called worship service back in the day. And we would come into worship service preparing to meet with God back in the day. And that meant that we were prepared. Literally, the service started at 11 o'clock in the morning. And we also had a Sunday night service at 7 o'clock every Sunday. And that was for decades. That was my whole life. And I've been in church all my life. My dad was a pastor for over 40 years. And I remember we would prepare ourselves. We would come in for worship ready. On We were actually there before it started. Literally there before church started. And Mary Lynn, there was a piano and an organ playing 10 or 15 minutes before. And people would come in and ready themselves. And, and, and kind of, you know, then the service would start. I thought, Boy, this is, if that's worship, that's pretty, pretty spectacular. And then I noticed something happened in the 1970s. And as I became a young adult, the charismatic movement took over, became a thing. And the charismatic movement basically was for people who were not traditional Pentecostals were starting to experience the Holy Spirit in their lives in a powerful way. And they didn't know what, what was happening. They had never been taught, really, and they just started experiencing. And so they started looking to classical Pentecostals like we were. How, what's, what's going on? And there was quite a, quite a movement going on. But something transitioned even in what we thought about as worship. And in the 1970s, we started doing something we had never done before. Because when we came into a service, basically, we would have somebody leading the singing, piano and an organ, and we would then sing three hymns. And on the third, we'd, we would sit this whole time. And on the, th on the last verse of the third hymn, we'd say, everybody stand for this last verse. And we'd all stand up and sing together. And then we would have the pastoral prayer following that. Very, very, very traditional. And it was in the 1970s that changed. And the fact that when we came in to sing, uh, we stood for everything. We begin to stand for everything. It just changed. And, I'm, and this isn't a criticism. It's just an observation from an old guy who's been down the road and has seen it. Neither good nor bad, but it changed. But during that, during that era, the, as the charismatic people began to become part, an influential part of what was going on, worship took on a definition, a different definition, and it became music. In fact, it, it, was, it was like worship... You know, you come and you sing, and a whole industry sprouted up of music. Again, neither good nor bad. It was just, it was just what it was. And, and people then started associating worship with singing, period. That's what it became. In fact, if you worship, music is required. So I'm going back today, and I want to look and, and tell you what worship is. We're never going to change that, by the way, how you worship. Some people are more expressive than other people. That doesn't mean that's how you worship. Some people are more reserved. That doesn't mean that's how you worship. We're all created uniquely by God, and we should express our worship to God. But I want you to know that worship is more than singing. It's more than music. 
It's more than praise. It's more than prayer. It's more than giving. It, it, it's, it's all that with a heart that's surrendered to God. Did you know even your work is worship? Your work is worship. This message is basically um, an adaptation from uh, an essential, essential number 12 from Pentecostal Essentials, which is a course that's available to you here, our Freedom Church family, or anybody that's online. Th these are free courses. Anything that we have here is free for you that we have produced ourselves. We want to make them available to you. Pentecostal Essentials, 30 traits of spirit-filled disciples living in community. And this is a course that I wrote, and this is Essential 12, and, it, and it's about the fact that we are people who are spiritual in our worship. We rely on the Holy Spirit in our worship. The global church, the worldwide church, has been enriched by the teaching of the Pentecostal movement Practicing the surrendering of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to do a work in us. So I encourage you to get to know who we are. If you're new to the Pentecostal church, this is a good starter for you to see these essentials. We're, how, we, how we frame ourselves based on the word of God and what we do. It's more than just this. It's more than just this. Today we examine your call to worship, which is a green light. We've all been called to worship. So let's go down, and I'll, go through, I'll move through these fairly quickly. First of all, worship is giving God your best. If you uh, have a Bible, you can read it. It'll be, uh, the scriptures will be, uh, a fair bit of them will be on the screen for you. You can go to your app, your uh, version app, and, and find your way through, and you can get that stuff. But first of all, Beyond everything else, worship is giving God your best. I love this scripture. If you know me, if you've been around, you'll know that you've heard me talk about this before a lot of times. This is a key scripture. And it says in Romans 12 and 1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as, living, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Notice what it says. This is your true and proper worship. So, worship is basically offering yourself to God for His pleasure. That's what it is. You are overwhelmed by God's grace in view of God's mercy to you, and you willingly say, God, I'm yours. That's worship has a million expressions, but that's worship, at the heart of worship. And this is not a suggestion. This is a directive that is given to us. In view of these things, this is what you do. God has created you, watches over you, reaches out to you, saves you from your sins by forgiving you. He provides for you. He directs you. He favors you with his presence. He keeps blessing you. Is he worthy of worship? Absolutely. Absolutely. In view of God's mercy, you deliberately choose to live each moment in a way that God approves. Think about it. Self-sacrifice is at the heart of the gospel. Jesus that we've been singing about today, his sacrifice, his blood applied voluntarily. Jesus gave himself up. He gave and set aside all of his divine privileges to take on human form, to walk among us as people. To be a revelation of God in flesh. Wow. He submitted himself to the most incredible cruelty and abuse of those influenced by Satan. Allowed himself to be put to death for crimes that he did not commit. That's self-sacrifice. He's the model of our worship. He did this, how? In obedience to the Father. He humbled himself. He, he gave himself fully. Jesus would teach that sacrifice, self-sacrifice, is, is an indispensable requirement for a disciple of Christ. He says in Luke 9, 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, 
and take up the cross daily and follow me. Well, what do you mean a disciple? What is that? Jesus talking about a disciple. Is that a follower? Like, didn't he just have 12 disciples? Well, we have a course for that. Another life transformation course called the Disciple of Christ will go deeper for you into this dynamic of denying yourself, taking up the cross of crucifying yourself and following Jesus. And those who will do that will show their love for Christ by obeying his commands. Well, what are his commands? Well, we have a course for that. It's called the Commands of Christ. It's another life transformation course that you can take. It's free. Go online. Find out those commands that Christ gave directly to those. Why do you do that? Because you're overwhelmed by his sacrifice. You want to worship him by giving your best. You have the green light to worship God. You are called to worship God. Hebrews 12, verses 28 and 29, let's say this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. I want you to know that worship is a serious business. It's not something flippant, something you do when you feel like it, something that's optional. You can't be cavalier. You have to understand who you're worshiping. Drawing yourself into God's holy presence is not to be treated lightly. Just look at the examples that we have from the Bible. Moses, when he was standing in front of the burning bush, took off his sandals because he recognized that he was on holy ground. He was so moved with the presence of God revealing himself as I am. Isaiah, when he had his vision of going into the temple in Isaiah chapter 6, was awestruck with the brilliance of God's holiness during that time and ever thing, every creature, everything fell before him, honoring him. And Isaiah could think of nothing less than how unworthy he was to be in God's presence. That's how serious you have to be when you worship. Remember Mary, after the resurrection, on that resurrection Sunday morning, she clasped the feet of Jesus in his resurrected body at the empty tomb. And what does it say? And she worshipped him. She couldn't help herself. Here was her Lord, her Savior, the one who had redeemed her. And here he was, alive like he said he was. And she couldn't help herself. She just had to worship. Worship. Remember Thomas, the doubter, one of the 12 disciples. And Jesus spent 40 days after his resurrection meeting with his followers. Hundreds of people who had been following him over time, his uh, disciples who became the apostles and others who supported him uh, during his ministry. And he went around for 40 days and taught them, it says in Acts, the first chapter, taught them about the kingdom of God. Taught them principles about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, Jesus shows up to the disciples to say, hello, I'm here, this is me. And they were amazed, but Thomas wasn't there. And when the other disciples told him what had happened, he went, really? Seriously? I don't know. It's hard to believe. And then what did Jesus do? Because it's Jesus who he is. He shows up again. And you remember the picture of Thomas? And he saw his risen Lord. And he went over, and what did he do? He touched the scars, the hands, the side. And all he could do was say, my Lord and my God. Is that your response when you think of Jesus, when you come into his presence? Oh, God, I'm so unworthy. Believers are called to worship God. It says in Hebrews 12, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. When you belong to the kingdom of God, you're good. 
That kingdom's not going anywhere. Kingdoms of the world are going to disappear. Every kingdom is going to disappear. You put your hope in a kingdom of any type, it's, it, it, you're putting it into something that's, that's going to fade away. But in the kingdom of God, you have eternal hope. It is secure. You've been adopted into God's family through faith in Christ. You're one of God's kids. He looks down at you today. You're my child. I love you. And so your worship is reasonable because of none of who you are or what you have is because of you. It's all because of God's grace and mercy to you. Now, the caution for our worship, that God is a consuming fire. God is so powerful, he's unlimited. He could wipe every one of us out just like that. We could be gone. Wipe us out. Come down, burn us up. He'd burn the whole world up if you wanted to right now. That's how powerful he is. But you know what? God's not interested in burning you up, burning your body up, getting rid of you. But what he is interested in is he wants to burn away all the stuff in us that shouldn't be there. This purifying holy flame of God through the Holy Spirit, the word in us, burning away, taking away all the weights that so hold us back, the things that that are there, the impediments that are there, the sins that we carry. He wants the cleanest of all that. He's a purifying, consuming fire. He wants to set us apart for his holy purposes. So the simplicity of worship is that God gives. He's always the initiator. God gives. And so we respond to his giving. That's what we do. That's what worship is. So here on Thanksgiving Sunday, it says in this Hebrews chapter 12, we also must worship God thankfully. Thankfully. True worship flows from a thankful heart. You know, have you ever found that there can be days that just seem to just go, like they just go through without a hitch? And then there are other days that you can't get through the next 15 minutes and something comes up. Have you, have you noticed that? Like life can be predict, unpredictable. You go through difficulties and challenges that require your attention. But you know what? Even when you're going through, you know what a good thing to do is? Thank God. Not for this ridiculous thing that's happening to you right now. He never said that. He didn't say, thank, thank God for that trial that I have to endure and go through. He said, thank God in spite of that trial that you're going through. Why? Because he's with you. You're going to make it. He's going to see you through. Absolutely. Are you a child of God? Then you're good. The closer you keep with the Lord, be thankful. When you face an issue that you didn't even see coming and some you did see coming, thank God. Thank God. What's our tendency? Oh, we can sometimes get down and get distracted and wonder how things are going. You know the best thing to do? Worship. Turn your attention and focus back to God. Here I am, Lord. I need you. I love you. I am so privileged to be your child. Experiencing wholeness and maturity in your life will be accelerated by thankful worship. When you become a person of gratitude instead of ingratitude, our world is filled with people who are unthankful for what they have. There is such an expectation today that I deserve what I don't have. And, and this entitlement is everywhere, and yet that's not us. We're privileged, not entitled. We have everything we need given to us as we need it. Aren't you thankful it's God that's organizing your life for you? Because most of the time, I would want stuff right now. Like right now. Like God right now. You know that thing right now? Anybody tracking with me on that one? Right, right now. No, no, right now. God, you don't understand. I got it. I got it. I need it right now. And God sits back. Oh, isn't that interesting? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that? It's like a, a parent talking to their child who knows how to run the home, run the business, run the finances. They don't know anything. Kids don't know anything. Kids, 
You don't know anything. <laughs> Literally. Just the, the, as soon as you come to terms with that, your life will be free. <laughs> you know nothing. Now, your parents don't know everything either, but they know more than you do. And when you come to that, there's, there's a freedom in that, isn't there? And it's the same with us, with God, our Heavenly Father. When we realize that He knows the whole deal, we know nothing. We literally don't know anything. Just admit it when you go to Him every time. God, I don't know. I don't know. But I'm going to come to you, and I thank you that you're with me. You must worship God acceptably. I referred to this a little earlier. But we must be very realistic about how we come to God. Not flippantly. Not, not just in some, hey, buddy, how's it going kind of a thing. You know, blah, blah, blah. I've seen people say, oh, no, that's the way you have a relationship. I've never felt that. I have, I've been cautious with that. There are some things that I, that I do in my life that I'm not saying that you have to do. But people have taken away some of the specialness about God and even references to God. For example, this is just me, not nobody else, but I never refer to anything as awesome, nothing as awesome except for God himself. I never do. There's all kinds of other words I use, like amazing, and I'll I'll say something, oh, that's astounding, or that's, I never use the word, because to me it's a special word. Awesome is God, not me. I'm not awesome. Your kids want you to tell them they're awesome. They're not awesome. You want your kids to tell you you're awesome. You're not awesome either. Nobody's awesome. God is awesome. Awesome. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Takes my breath away. Early and I, like, when we think about how God's been good to us, it takes our breath away. We can't even... Like, every day we, we, get, we get overwhelmed with how good God's been to us. Have we had challenges? Oh, yeah. We're normal human beings. Have we blown it lots of times? Absolutely. Is God still awesome? <laughs> He's always awesome. Always awesome. But, friends, it does matter how you worship God. It does matter. He's the center of the universe. You're not. He's the center of the universe. Being in awe of God is your concession that he's beyond compare. And you are undeservedly privileged to be invited into his presence. Develop a healthy fear for the Lord because you understand what he can do with his limited power. You're not afraid that he's going to squish you. He's going to punish you. He's going to, you know, always be wagging his finger at you because you don't get it right all the time. No, that's not what this is. You're not afraid of eternal death. You don't live in dread that he's going to punish you, but he's going to welcome you into his eternal kingdom. You'll be with him forever and ever. You don't have to be afraid. Nothing in this earth can touch that. Nothing. So you come and you fear him Meaning that you trust in him, believe in him, but you're not afraid because he's invited you into his presence. The Bible makes very clear that you're to worship God only. Go back to the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments in, the, uh, in Exodus chapter 20. You don't hear a lot about it anymore, but we're working on a solution for that. There is a course that I'm working on right now. (laughs) The Ten Commandments. But it's interesting. God says through Moses, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above or on earth, beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, Emma, a a jealous God. He's jealous for you. You belong to him. And when you start straying and giving your love and allegiance to someone other than him, he, he doesn't like that. It grieves his heart. 
And you can think about the things that you might worship other than God. Maybe it hasn't even crossed your mind, the things you've been drawn, that you put ahead of God who have become idols for you. It's so easy to do because you have been created like everyone that's been created with a desire to worship God. And you're always going to worship something to satisfy that craving. Anything other than God, though, will never satisfy your craving. When you give in to temptations to worship other things like people or material possessions or experiences, your life will be misaligned and disordered. Your object of worship has that kind of a transformational effect on you because you tend to take on the characteristics and values as your own of that which you worship. The focus of your worship affects the way you see the world around you, so make sure that God is the one that you worship. Did you know, I don't have my hard copy here, but if I did, I'd hold it up of a Bible. So if you have a Bible, you put your hand on it or your little thing like But that is actually a worship book from cover to cover. Your Bible is a worship book from cover to cover. Did you ever think about it like that? If you go through it, it's a worship book. It's a story about God, who he is, how he's made himself known, and about mankind's response to him. God created the universe essentially as one gigantic worship center with him on the throne over it all. He's right now, right this moment, sitting on the throne over the whole universe. And you as his creation are, re are required to acknowledge him as your creator, as your sustainer, as your savior, and as your provider. And the Bible is a great guide to worshiping God. So that's why another reason why you need to study it. And God prioritized worshiping him in the Ten Commandments he gave to Moses. He underlined conduct that is acceptable to him with a concise list of spiritual principles and practical applications. And while the Old Testament law is not binding on us today as believers because Jesus came and instituted a new law, a new commandment in him based in his blood, we do get timeless teaching about knowing, loving, and serving God well. The first four of the Ten Commandments concern how we must respond to God, and the final six of the Ten Commandments address respecting our relationships with other people. Worshiping other things, friends, worshiping other things than God is the biggest mistake you will ever make in your life. We've talked about this earlier. Worship God as a living sacrifice. Romans 12 and 1, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, I don't know about you, but the concept of being a living sacrifice is a little bit hard to visualize, isn't it? Like, what, what does that mean? Be, what, what's that referring to? What is a sacrifice? And how do you give your body to God as a sacrifice? Is your sacrifice holy and pleasing to God before or during or after it's made? Do any of us really know what it means to sacrifice? The Apostle Paul wrote these words in Romans chapter 12, 2,000 years ago, to people who understood what was meant by sacrificing. Anyone who knew the teaching of the Old Testament was familiar that sacrificing was a major part of worshiping God. And the people would show their devotion to God and their love for Him by giving Him something they owned, placing it on the altar to be fully consumed by fire. That's what they did. And that worship was genuine worship when it came at a personal cost. It required a sacrifice of time, sacrifice of money, sacrifice of obeying God's instructions carefully. And so worshipers wanted to please the Lord and acknowledge His goodness and His blessing to them so they would do all of that willingly. And once that gift was given to God... In sacrifice, it was his. You couldn't take it back. 
Literally, you couldn't take that gift back. Once you give a gift, you can't take it back. It's given. It belonged to the Lord who decided what was done with it. I heard a, uh, somebody say oh, years ago, he said, you know the problem with living sacrifices? They have a tendency to want to keep crawling off the altar. God, here I am. It's all yours. It's all yours. It's all yours. But maybe, and then you start. Ever happened to you? Happened to me once or twice? Or a hundred times? Or a thousand times? Living sacrifices have a tendency to keep crawling off the altar. Sacrificing yourself to God is not being a human sacrifice, like giving your body on a physical altar, like the dead animals and other objects were placed. But we are now living sacrifices, living sacrifices, offered at a spiritual offer, which can be found where? Here at the front of the church. No, anywhere in the world. Anywhere you are, you can worship at an altar. It's holy because God is there. Sacrificing yourself to God means turning over ownership of everything to the Lord willingly to be used any way He chooses. You willingly give up what's valuable to you for His sake. And you make clear your love and gratitude to God is for who He is and what He has done on your behalf. And that your sacrificial response to him always is reasonable. In fact, the King James Version used to translate that in, instead of this is your spiritual worship or your true spiritual worship. It used to say this is your reasonable service. I like that way that it puts it because it is reasonable when you consider the exchange of what God's given us and what we give him back. There's, there's no comparison. I think stewardship is a, I think that sacrificial worship is a stewardship issue. What I mean by that is you are given everything you have by God to manage it for Him. Everything. You name everything. Make a list, an inventory of everything you have. Everything you are, everything you have. It's all because of God. It's all because of God. There's nothing. There's nothing excluded in that. Everything you are and have is because of God. And he has given it to you to take care of, to manage it well. You wisely use every resource in a way that pleases God. You honor the Lord with everything, and he blesses your offering. I think of this, which is a, as a principle, a, a, a timeless principle about honoring the Lord, for example, with your money, your tithes, and your offerings as a sacrifice. When you give, just don't give because it's an obligation. You give as an act of worship. And when you tithe, that's 10% of your income, plus offerings beyond that, every week, God does something. It's transformational. He accepts your act of faith, believing that he's going to look, you're believing that he's going to look after all your needs. And what, is, what do you find happen? When you do that, he increases your blessings so that you're able to keep giving. And giving. You give and get. And give and get. But it starts with worship. You give. You honor the Lord with your time as sacrifice. God accepts your acts of service and increases your fruitfulness. You honor the Lord with your talents and giftings as sacrifice. And God accepts your spiritual exercising and increases your impact. You honor the Lord with your praise as sacrifice. And God accepts your acknowledging him and increases your hunger for more of him. And God accepts you honor the Lord with your work as sacrifice. And it changes you. How would it change you when you went to work as an example and treated it as worship to God? How would that change the way you looked at your work? The quality that you would give it, the way that you would respond, the thankfulness that you would have for that, even in difficult and challenging circumstances, all of it belongs to God.
Living sacrifices, it says, are holy and acceptable to God. And so what I'm saying is that worship is not just a, an act of praise or an act of prayer or an act of devotion or an act of giving or an act of anything. It's all of that. And you and I are called. We're given the green light to be worshipers of God in everything. There's a passage in Philippians 5, 18 to 20. Take some time. I won't this morning. But this whole passage in chapter 5, a big, a big chunk of it, it talks about living the spirit-filled life. And let me tell you, you're going to do none of what I've said this morning just by saying you're going to. You need something to help you do that. In fact, you need someone to help you do that. And that someone is the Holy Spirit. And you stay filled with the Spirit, and He'll help you live this life. Be filled with the Spirit. I'll just read it and then move on to close. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. That's capital S. Always capital S refers to the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I can't think of a better way to finish up on this Thanksgiving Sunday. Giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit will help you do that. When you live this way, you are showing that you are a sacrificial worshiper that pleases God. The Holy Spirit in you will inspire you to offer your best to God in every situation and remind you that what you're doing actually is to please God. You take every moment and living it the way that honors the Lord, and you realize that this is spiritual worship at its best. Oh, I love these times when we get together. I love worshiping with other believers. That's amazing. I, pr I pray that it'll always continue, that we'll always do this. We'll always have opportunities to do this. But I worshiped long before I got here, friends. I was worshiping yesterday. When I go out for a run, I worship, and I said to Arlene this, this morning, I said, man, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm prepared or whatever for this morning because, I mean, I got so many thoughts. There's so many things I could say. And the problem is I went out for a nice long run yesterday, and, I, and, and, and the Holy Spirit just keeps talking to me. And he keeps telling me stuff. And he tells me stuff about because I say, Lord, give me, give me a favor tomorrow as I, as I speak your word and I pray. And then he keeps giving me ideas. And I got, I've already got everything. I, and he keeps giving. And I don't have anything to write it down with. As I'm, and I'm running. And, I'm, and I say, it's just so, but that's the abundance of God. He not only meets your needs, he goes way beyond every time. That's who we serve, friends. This is spiritual worship at its best when you consider him in all things and offer yourself to him in love and sacrifice. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I've added verse 2 to that previous one. Doesn't that sound like a great deal? You're called by God to worship Him. You have the green light to do that, and when you do, you will find yourself being transformed every time. And you will become a worshiper who regularly gathers with others to worship God like in settings just like this. And that's the encouragement today. For those of you that are looking online, I want to encourage you right where you are. Worship God. Worship God. Give Him your best. Be a living sacrifice. And for those of us in here, we're just going to take a moment 
and respond to the Lord. We're just going to take time to say, Lord, I'm awestruck by you. You've spoken to me today. Notice what I said earlier that when I started out with that little story, that wasn't all that I wanted you to remember. But you have a green light to worship. Keep in step with the Spirit, and He will help you do that. Pastor Tracy, it's been an honor. And I pray that God will take this word and seal it on everyone's heart and that we'll live it out to the full as living sacrifices to God. Blessings. Thank you.